This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 36. Coming up on Space Time, magma could be the key to the moon's makeup, more meteorite grains providing new clues about the solar system's origins, and China confirms plans to have an operational moon base within 10 years. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. New computer simulations have provided some new clues about the birth of the moon. Evidence from rock samples brought back by the American Apollo manned moon missions, together with studies from early Earth geology, suggest the best hypothesis to explain Earth's moon is the so-called giant impact theory, in which a Mars-sized planet, which scientists have named Thea, and possibly an Earth Trojan, or at the very least a rogue planet, slammed into the early proto-Earth about 62 million years after the birth of our solar system 4.6 billion years ago. 62 million years is the best estimate based on an age range of 52 million to 152 million years based on measurements of tungsten isotopes found in lunar metals. The massive cosmic collision would have melted most of both bodies into a magma ocean. Thea's dense iron and nickel core would have coalesced with that of the Earth. While at the same time, vaporized debris from Thea's lighter silicate mantle and crust, together with some from the Earth, would have been ejected into space, eventually orbiting the Earth as a giant ring, before slowly coalescing to form the Moon as we see it today. Being composed mostly of silicates neatly explains why the Moon isn't as dense as the Earth. However, most computer simulations suggest that the giant impact hypothesis would result in our Moon being composed primarily of material from Thea. Now, the problem with that is, it seems the opposite is true, based again on rocks brought back by the Apollo missions, which strongly suggest that the Moon consists mainly of material from the Earth. And so we have a conundrum. But now a new study reported in the journal Nature Geoscience offers an explanation. The key is the idea that the early proto-Earth was still covered in a magma ocean when Thea hit. You see, Thea is about the size of Mars, so only about a third the size of the Earth. Being so much smaller, it loses its heat more quickly, and so, by the time the collision happened, Thea may have already been solid, while the Earth was still very much a molten magma ocean. Now, for this study, the authors examined the compression of molten silicates, and then developed computerized models to predict how the material from the collision could have become the Moon. They were able to show that after the collision, magma is heated much more than solids from the impacting object. This magma, which comes primarily from the Earth, then expands in volume and goes into orbit to form the Moon. Now, this very neatly explains why there's much more Earth material in the lunar makeup. The authors say previous models did not account for the different degrees of heating between the proto-Earth silicate and the Thea impactor. In this new computer simulation, about 80% of the Moon is made up of proto-Earth materials, while in most previous models, about 80% of the Moon was made up from the impactor. Of course, there have been other explanations for this, and I provided a clue to one of them in the introduction of this story. I described Thea as possibly being a Trojan, that is, a body orbiting the Sun on the same orbit as the Earth, but either 60 degrees ahead or behind the Earth. Now, if Thea was a Trojan and it was formed at the same distance from the Sun as the Earth, then that would explain the similar compositions. All that would be then required is some other body to gravitationally perturb Thea, disrupt it from its orbit, and send it crashing into the Earth. But to find out more about this new theory, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr. Fred Watson. This new theory about how the Moon was created, what's this all about? The best theory we have for the origin of the Moon, and this goes back really to the Apollo era, is that very early in the Earth's history, within the first 100 million years certainly, maybe even within the first 50 million years, and remember the Earth is, like the rest of the solar system, is 4.6 billion years old. Very early in the Earth's history, the Earth suffered a collision with an object about the size of Mars. And we're so confident with this view of the origin of the Moon that actually that colliding object has a name. It's been called Thea, which in mythology is the mother of Selene, the Moon. 
moon. So it's a very nice link. So Thea bashed into the earth, raised a cloud of debris, which accreted, um, came together, stuck together under gravity, eventually to form the moon. So it started off with a earth that's been pretty well bashed up with a, a disk of material around it, which has been thrown up by the collision. And from that, the moon forms. The problem with that is, once again, something that we learn from the Apollo missions. Um, what the Apollo missions taught us, the astronauts brought back 382 kilograms of lunar soil uh, and rock. And those materials, apart from the fact that they are, they're different, that the soil is different from earthly soil, because it's all got sharp edges rather than being rounded by erosion, as the particles of earth soil has. So the particles are different, but chemically, it's the same. And in particular, there's something called the oxygen isotope ratio. Chemicals come with different isotopes, which correspond to different numbers of neutrons in their nuclei. And the oxygen isotope ratio for moon rock and earth rock is identical. And what that tells you is that it is extremely unlikely that the moon's material came from anywhere else other than the Earth. But the problem with the Thea hypothesis is that if something bashes into the Earth and you've got this cloud of debris raised, which forms the moon, most of the cloud is made up of material from Thea itself. And the odds of that being identical to the Earth are very, very low indeed. So there have been all kinds of dynamical arguments about, you know, maybe it was people have looked at glancing collisions and it turns out that maybe that would give you more of the Thea material in the, uh, sorry, the Earth's material in the moon than Thea material. They've looked at the opposite, which is, you know, head on direct collisions very deep into the Earth's uh, inner material. And that too would give you some Earth like material in orbit to form the moon. But they've all got inadequacies, those. None of them are very straightforward because you've got to tinker around with things like the total spin of the system and things of that sort. So, this new theory, which has come from Yale University, it's, I think it's a, ja a Japanese born scientist who has uh, done the work with uh, with colleagues in Japan. I think it's a, a joint US-Japanese project. They've built a model that says, OK, what if the young Earth was still covered by a sea of molten rock, molten magma, magma right. that it's still so hot that the rocks on it are liquid? That would have been the case about 50 million years after the solar system formed. So it's still pretty early in the solar system. So you've got this hot and melted Earth, molten Earth, but then you hit it with something that's much smaller. And because it's smaller, it's actually cooled so that the, the surface is solid. And if you do that, apparently what you get is exactly what the moon is like. I think this is a theory that really goes a long way towards improving our understanding of the formation of the moon. And it's it, it ties in with some of the other aspects of the, the moon that we know about. So a very hot Earth is probably one reason why the moon's crust on the Earth side is thinner than the crust on the far side. Uh, because if the Earth was still very hot when the moon had been locked into this uh, what's called tidal locking, where the, the moon's uh, always facing the same face towards the Earth. If the, if the Earth was still very hot, there would be significant radiant heat falling on the early moon. It, at that stage, it was only, I think it was about 40,000 kilometres away from the Earth. It was very, very close. It was mm. the sort of distance that the geostationary satellites are. And that radiant heat actually chemically affects the surface and makes it easier for rocks to build on the far side, which is why the crust is thicker on the far side. So this ties in very much with what we know about the morphology of the moon and gives you a, a, a really good model for how the moon formed with most of the proto-Earth material. So it was a molten Earth struck by a solid object. Yeah, and... or an object with a solid surface. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, are, we, uh, are they suggesting that that solid object or the object with a solid surface is the moon with an Earth coating? Or it just spread no, that, off into space no, somewhere. No, no. So, so it's still, it, it probably disintegrated itself, and uh, and it may well have been on a trajectory that took it. You know, the, the bits of that are probably still lurking in the asteroid belt somewhere because they've been shepherded by the gravity of Jupiter. But the, the the bottom line is that with a collision like that, the material that you throw up into orbit around the Earth is mostly Earth material rather than Thea material. Okay, but if they were to do enough sniffing around, they might find. Thea material on the moon. Uh, that's that's right. Um, let me let me just read a comment by the, um, the the lead author whose name I'm about to mispronounce. It is <laughs> Sonichiro Karato, and he comments in our model 
about 80% of the moon is made of proto-Earth materials. Proto-Earth is the young Earth. In most of the previous models, about 80% of the moon is made of the impactor, that's Thea. Mm. And this is a big difference. It absolutely is. And it seems to provide a very neat solution to the, uh, to the problem. That's Professor Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A tiny grain of dust older than our solar system could be shining some new light on how planetary systems are formed. The microscopic extraterrestrial particle, which originated in an explosive thermonuclear eruption on the surface of a dead star more than 4.6 billion years ago, was discovered inside a chondritic meteorite collected in Antarctica. As scientists examined the tiny speck of stardust using electron microscopes in order to examine the arrangement of carbon atoms in their variants, known as carbon isotope anomalies, they discovered that this pre-solar graphite grain contained oxygen-rich silicates, something they didn't expect to see. The observations reported in the journal Nature Astronomy is providing scientists with new insights into the conditions of white dwarf stars undergoing nova events. It also contradicts the hypothesis that the two primary types of stardust material, oxygen and carbon-rich, which are the pre-solar building blocks in the formation of a solar system, could not form in the same nova outburst under the same conditions. Now, as we mentioned last week when we talked about a very similar story, a nova is a massive thermonuclear explosion occurring on the surface of a dead sun-like star called a white dwarf. See, if the white dwarf is in a close binary system with another star, the white dwarf's intense gravity can draw material off the outer gaseous envelope of the companion star. This material will pile up on the surface of the white dwarf until the pressures and temperatures increase enough to trigger a thermonuclear explosion, a nova. And because the white dwarf isn't destroyed in the blast, it can continue drawing more and more material off its stellar companion, eventually triggering another nova event, and so on and so on and so forth. The cycle continues. Now, all this material being blown off in the nova explosion gets scattered across the interstellar medium, eventually adding to the composition of molecular gas and dust clouds from which new star systems and their planets are formed. Since shortly after the Big Bang, when the universe consisted only of hydrogen and helium, with traces of lithium and a little bit of beryllium, stellar explosions like novae and supernovae have contributed to the chemical enrichment of the cosmos, resulting in the plethora of elements we see today. Catalogued as LAP149, the dust grain in our study represents the only known assemblage of graphite and silicate grains that can be traced to a nova event. This tiny messenger turned out to be truly alien, highly enriched in the carbon isotope 13C. The carbon isotopic compositions in anything we have sampled that comes from any planet or body in our solar system can vary typically by a factor of up to 50. But the 13C isotope found in LAP149 is enriched more than 50,000-fold. The results provide further laboratory evidence that both carbon and oxygen-rich grains from Nervae contributed to the building blocks of our solar system. And further analysis revealed an even more unexpected secret. Unlike similar grains thought to have been forged in dying stars, LAP149 is the first known grain consisting of graphite that contains an oxygen-rich silicate inclusion. And this tells scientists about how dust grains form and move around the inside as they're expelled from the nova. It shows that carbonaceous and silicate dust grains can form in the same nova ejector and get transported across chemically distinct clumps of dust and gas within the ejector, something that had been predicted but never actually seen. One of the study's authors, Professor Jane Howe from the University of Toronto, says this pre-solar widow particle has shown science something not known before, exactly how dying stars see the universe with raw materials for the formation of new stars and planets and ultimately as precursor molecules for life. Although such grains are believed to provide important raw materials contributing to the mix from which the Sun and our planets formed, they rarely survive the turmoil that goes with the birth of a solar system. But when they do survive, they provide a direct snapshot of the conditions in the star at the time when the grain was formed. And that's pretty spectacular. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Beijing's confirmed it will have an operational lunar base on the surface of the moon within 10 years. 
The official Xinhua news agency says the new facility will be positioned near the moon's south pole. The announcement is part of the greatest push by China yet to become a major space power. Beijing's now spending more on its space programs than either Russia or Japan and is second only in investment to the United States. As part of its plan, China will launch its next lunar lander, the Chung'e 5, later this year. Its Chung'e 4 is still operational, studying the lunar surface on the far side of the moon. Beijing's also planning to carry out the maiden flight of a new, more powerful Long March 5B rocket next year. And it expects to establish its first permanent Tiangong or Heavenly Palace Earth Orbiting Space Station by 2022, with the first modules for that station to be orbited next year using the new Long March 5B. Meanwhile, a Long March 4B rocket has just blasted off from the Taiwan Satellite Launch Center in northeastern China, carrying two Tianhu 201 Earth Observation satellites into a 500 km high low Earth orbit. Beijing euphemistically describes the spacecraft as being designed for scientific experiments, primarily mapping, land resources, and geographic surveys. But interestingly, unlike most legitimate scientific missions, no other details about this highly secretive flight have been released. However, we do know that China did launch three previous Tianhu satellites in 2010, 2012, and 2015 into almost identical orbits, and all that suggests an awful lot of mapping land resource and geographical surveys. The flight marked the 303rd launch of a Long March series rocket and the seventh orbital mission by China so far this year. Meanwhile, a Chinese Long March 3B rocket has carried a new Bidao or Compass Navigation satellite into orbit from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in Sichuan Province. Bidao satellites are grouped into three different constellations placed at different altitudes. The mission was the first Bidao flight for the year, the 44th launch of a Bidao satellite, and the first BDS-3 satellite stationed in inclined geosynchronous Earth orbit. Up to 10 Bidao satellites are slated for launch this year. The launch marked the 100th flight of a Long March 3B rocket. Now, just a few weeks earlier, another Long March 3B, also launched from Chang, successfully placed the military telecommunications satellite into orbit. The Tanlian-201 is the first of a new generation of spacecraft designed to provide high-speed control communications and data relay services for China's People Liberation Army and for its growing space operations, including its planned new space station and future Shenzhou manned space missions. However, things haven't all gone well for China's space program of late. Back in March, the nation's first privately funded rocket failed in an attempt to place a technology demonstration Earth observation satellite into orbit. The One Space OS-1M rocket was also launched from the Chang Satellite Launch Center. However, it suffered a second stage anomaly shortly after first stage separation. The three-stage OS-1M is a solid fuel rocket using retired Chinese military satellite motors. It's capable of placing a 200 kilogram payload into a 300 kilometer high orbit. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Scientists have linked greenhouse gas emissions and the release of aerosol pollutants with patterns of drought and rainfall over the 20th century. The findings reported in the journal Nature are showing how human activities may have been affecting drought on this planet for at least the last hundred years. The study showed how drought had increased between 1900 and 1949, then became less severe between 1950 and 1975, before increasing again and accelerating to current levels ever since. Researchers found this pattern is consistent with increasing levels of greenhouse gas emissions, both in the first half of the 20th century and towards the end of the 20th century. While the reversal of this trend between 1950 and 1975 coincides with an increase in the production of aerosols, which have been shown to affect rainfall and alter cloud cover. Another study has suggested that taking the common diabetes drug metformin may help maintain long-term weight loss. The findings, reported in the Annals of Internal Medicine, are based on a trial of more than 3,000 participants with pre-diabetes. It compared weight loss programs and diabetes prevention with lifestyle interventions, the drug metformin, or a placebo. In the first year, researchers saw a 5% loss in body weight among those in the lifestyle intervention group. However, over the long term, that is 6 to 15 years, those assigned metformin had far greater success in maintaining weight loss. 
The results add to earlier studies suggesting an effective approach to preventing diabetes is lifestyle change combined with metformin over the long term. A new study claims healthcare workers in intensive care units are failing to regularly clean their hands during the care of patients despite the risk of spreading deadly infections. The findings were reported to the European Congress of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. Meanwhile, a separate study also reported at the same conference has found privacy screens in hospitals, which may be meant to give you a little bit of decency when drawn, are frequently touched but rarely cleaned, meaning they could potentially be overlooked as another means of disease transmission. Researchers found that one in five, or a total of 334 cultures taken from privacy curtains, tested positive for multi-drug resistant organisms, or superbugs. And the conference was also warned that tourniquets, one of the most widely used and reused devices in healthcare, are also likely to be hiding a few nasties. Researchers found the majority of tourniquets they inspected contained potentially harmful microbes, such as E. coli, which can cause very serious infections. And while we're on the subject, the conference was also told that one in five travellers visiting low- or middle-income countries end up contracting some form of multidrug-resistant bacteria. In fact, the study found those who stayed at a hotel or private accommodation were four times more likely to bring home multi-drug-resistant bacteria than those who stayed in other types of accommodation such as guest houses, hostels or campsites. Happy holidays! U.S. intelligence agencies have identified an anti-satellite laser base in China's western Zhejiang province. The report, looking at challenges to security in space, examines Russian, Chinese, Iranian and North Korean space capabilities. The newly identified Chinese facility includes four main buildings with sliding roofs, three of which house high-energy chemical lasers. These are reported to have a range of up to 1,000 kilometres, generating over 300 watts per square centimetre, enough to destroy a satellite's detectors, solar panels and other components. A fourth smaller building in the complex was found to house satellite tracking dishes. The new energy weapon site built in research undertaken by China back in 2006, which used lasers to dazzle orbiting satellites by temporarily blinding the satellite's optical sensors. Beijing claims the allegations of a satellite laser base are completely groundless. But it's not alone in these games. The report also says Russia delivered a laser weapon to its aerospace forces prior to early last year, also likely intended for anti-satellite missions. Well, it looks like the popular blogging platform Tumblr could be on the market, with growing reports that its owners Verizon have approached other companies to gauge their interest in acquiring the blogging platform. Tumblr hosts almost half a billion blogs, with what experts describe as some of the best and most interesting posts online. The platform was acquired by Yahoo for $1.1 billion in 2013, with Yahoo then being acquired by Verizon in 2017 for $4.5 billion. However, last year's decision to ban adult content blogs from Tumblr has seen it lose some 30% of its traffic, from $521 million before the ban in December down to $437 million after the ban in January. The biggest problems were the algorithms used to detect and automatically block images and videos of adult content, because they commonly, wrongly also block legitimate non-adult material, thereby frustrating the vast majority of Tumblr users who aren't there for the porn. Now, ironically, one of the platform's potential buyers is Pornhub, who've told BuzzFeed News they're extremely interested in buying Tumblr and restoring it to its former glory. Engineers have invented a new bridge design which would allow significantly longer bridge spans to be built in the future. The new bridge forms reported in the Proceedings of the Royal Society use a new mathematical modelling technique to identify optimal designs for very, very long bridge spans. A bridge's span is the distance of suspended roadways between towers, with the current world record held by the Japanese at just under 2 kilometres. The most popular forms for long spans are suspension bridges, although cable stayed bridge designs, where cables directly connect the tower to the roadway, are becoming increasingly popular. This new bridge design is different because it uses split towers with multiple spokes. But that's enough to give you a 5 km long span, which is the sort of thing that will be required to cross the 14 km wide Strait of Gibraltar from the Iberian Peninsula to Morocco. A traditional suspension bridge design for such a distance would require far more material, making it at least 73% heavier than the optimal design. Now, by contrast, the proposed two- and three-spoke designs would be just 12 and 16% heavier, making them potentially much more economical to build. 
And time now for the dumbest story of the week. And we can't really go past the Taiwanese UFO true believer who claims to have discovered a secret alien base on the moon. The dude claims he discovered it while searching through NASA archival data and that NASA's intentionally covering up the facility for unknown reasons. Now, rather than a secret alien flying saucer facility on the moon, Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says this is more likely a clear case of pareidolia. It does look like a round structure of sorts, but it's basically, it's got a bit of a triangle on one side and a bit of a semi-triangle on the other. It looks like it's got two big columns coming out the front. It looks like one of the buildings on Tatooine in Star Wars, where Anakin grew up. You know, it's one of those sort of desert-looking things, a bit, but of course everything's in the eye of the beholder. It is, actually say, a a case of pareidolia, of people seeing things that they want to see. If it's not a base base, an alien base on the moon, it's the man in the moon, which is interesting because in Western society we see a man's face on the moon and I think in Chinese society they see a rabbit, other people see someone pushing a wheelbarrow and if you go out and look at the moon you can see all three of those. So therefore people see things that they want to see. This has a look of a structure but it's not a structure and, and that's the whole difference that people at NASA are saying that uh, it's probably just a rock formation. It could be anything without actually having got to go there and have a look at it but uh, it's just a rock formation that happens to have a similar shape the same as the face on Mars. Exactly. Sorry, was, yeah, uh, on Mars. At Sidonia, where we had this, looked like a set of pyramids, a uh, ruined city, and of course, a sphinx like face on Mars. And it really did look like that until the it angle did. of the light changed. And then all of a sudden yes. you realize, ah, oh, it's just a bunch of rocks. Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, I mean the, the face is the thing people see most in pareidolia. Yeah. The human mind is wired to see faces, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Which we, and we see them all the time, whether it's a face of Jesus in a bit of toast or whatever. I mean, the face is the thing you see, first of all, as a person, as a kid. A baby is someone staring down at you and smiling at you and that is very much implanted that's how you recognize people that's how, how you see the world you see that you know, faces are such a simple shape a round bit with two lines and a mouth two dots and a mouth is a face and that makes any sort of formation similar to that look like a face even if it's not but this one is just one of many things that are spotted uh, all over the place these things take off they go viral for a while then they disappear and the next one comes around very few of them like the face on Mars very few of them have that sort of longevity and you'll find that some will disappear pretty quickly especially when someone sort of finds out what it is. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Times also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.